Okay. Yep. The beer will be starting at 11. Um, so, <laughs> have some courage. Drink up. Um, there's vouchers in all your bags for food. Um, so, you can use those throughout the day. And um, prizes will be given out at the end of the conference. So, um, make sure you win an iPad. And some of the information on the contest will be tweeted, so if you're not following her account on Twitter, if you want to play this stuff, you need to. And we'll send updates and stuff. That's all I got, so have fun, run amok, um, break some stuff, and now you're a boxing. Don't process credit cards on the wireless. <laughs>
on using SSL script, which is a different tool that I wrote. So just to break it down for you, on one hand, we have the CEO of Komodo saying this was clinically orchestrated, you know, a super sophisticated attacker. On the other hand, we have someone who's literally following video tutorials on the internet. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Hack5. Hack5 is kind of like a, you know, introduction to some, some basic, you know, computer security concepts. It's designed for uh, new users, probably. Um, I don't, I haven't seen this video. Maybe it's really good. Maybe it turned them into clinical attackers. I'm not sure. Um, and then throughout the day, actually, there was a number of uh, times when the same attacker, you know, visited my website um, a few more times, and, and I could see their, their Google search queries, uh, you know, the search terms that they used to visit my website. And there were things like SSL protocol, man in the middle, how to, IP tables, pre-routing. Um, having trouble with this IP table setup, I guess. So I was kind of chuckling to myself about all of this, and, uh, and then, uh, this guy posts a communique to Pastebit, and it could not have been more embarrassing for anybody, really. Um, you know, on one hand, he's making these impossible claims, like he can decrypt RSA, and on the other hand, he's making these like really um, extravagant, or he's he's talking with bravado about really simple things, like how he can export functions from DLLs and create his own soapy PIs. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, he just wouldn't shut up. He just kept posting communiques, each more embarrassing than the last, you know. Um, and so, you know, this doesn't look very good for Komodo. I mean, here's this guy who's obviously pretty clueless, who's, you know, posting these, like, really embarrassing communiques. He just won't stop. He's just doing interviews with reporters, you know. People are emailing him, and he's responding, you know. It looked awful for everybody, you know. Uh, and so the, the CEO of Komodo responds to all of this by issuing a statement. Uh, where he said, if there were a secure and trusted DNS, this issue would not be a, this issue would be a moot point. We need a secure and trusted DNS! Exclamation point. And so he's just very enthusiastically declared that he does not understand the business that he's in. <laughs> you know, on one hand, he seems to be implying that the only way to perform a man-in-the-middle attack or intercept uh, secure communication is through DNS tampering, which is not true. Uh, and on the other hand, he's, what he's essentially saying is that if there were no way to perform a man-in-the-middle attack, the fact that these certificates were forged would not be an issue. I'm not sure he realizes that the reason that we're buying certificates from him is because it's possible to perform a man-in-the-middle attack. If it weren't, we wouldn't need the certificates from him. Uh, this is the guy that's securing a quarter of the internet. Um, a month later, Komodo got hacked again, twice more. Uh, and then a few weeks later, they got hacked again. Now, so interesting, you know, I, I wouldn't normally take this much time to just rag on Komodo. But I, I think it's interesting because I think it, um, you know, there's an interesting question here, which is that, you know, what happened to Komodo? After all of this, couldn't have been worse, couldn't have been more embarrassing. And what happened to them? Nothing. Nothing happened to Komodo. They didn't lose business, they didn't get sued, they didn't, you know, they didn't, uh, lose customers. Um, in fact, the only thing that happened to come out of this year is that uh, the CEO was named Entrepreneur of the Year at RSA. And so I think that this really illustrates the problem, that this is, this is the situation that we're in. Um, so let, I want to take, a, let's step backwards a little bit and uh, look at just the high level. Any secure protocol needs to provide three things, secrecy, integrity, and authenticity. You gotta have all three. Uh, if you, if one of these things breaks, the whole protocol breaks. Um, and so SSL is a secure protocol, and it aims to provide these three things. But you have to remember that SSL uh, was designed in the early '90s, and, and that was that was a long time ago. Uh, things were different then. There wasn't a lot of information about designing secure protocols at the time. Um, you know, books like Applied Cryptography hadn't been published yet. Um, you know, if you were to, if you wanted to use RSA, the algorithm you had to license the patent from RSA, the company. You had to pay money to use RSA in your product. Um, you know, things like e-commerce didn't exist yet. The very notion of transmitting your credit card number across the internet was totally foreign. It wasn't something that people did. Um, things like web applications didn't even really exist. The idea of even transmitting, you know, user credentials to some kind of dynamic, you know, back end 
uh, was, was a totally foreign concept. Um, and the internet was tiny. You know, according to IC, there were less than 5 million hosts on the internet at the time that SSL was designed. Compare that to today, where there's more than four, we're about to run out of publicly facing IP addresses at 4 billion. Um, so at the time that SSL was designed, there were really less than 10 secure sites that you could even imagine. You know, 10 sites that for whatever reason you would want to be your you know, communication to be encrypted with. Whereas today there are more than 2 million certificates on the internet. And ideally we'd like all sites to be secure. Um, SSL was also designed at Netscape in the early 90s where people were working under a lot of intense pressure. I mean this is the same place where the series of forwarding of decisions gave us JavaScript. We're still dealing with that. So it's actually kind of heroic how well they did and how, how well this protocol has stood the test of time. You know, when it comes to things like secrecy and integrity, they did okay. Uh, there were some problems along the way, there's still some problems. Um, but the real stumbling block was authenticity. And that's, that's what's caused uh, a lot of friction the whole time and is now causing real problems. Now, authenticity is important. Um, because, you know, ideally you'd like to establish a secure, a secure session with, uh, between two parties. Um, now, the obvious problem is that your connection could get intercepted in between and both parties end up establishing independent secure sessions with a third party who just shuttles data back and forth and you know, performs a classic man in the middle attack. Now, the interesting thing is that at the time, this was entirely theoretical when SSL was designed. You know, these things man in the middle attacks, people weren't doing this. The network tools didn't exist. Uh, this wasn't the kind of thing that was happening all the time, or had it ever happened. It was just this theoretical thing. Oh, well, the, you know, theoretically, you know, it could work like this. Um, and so the solution that they ended up coming up with was uh, certificates and certificate authorities, where every site uh, gets a certificate that identifies it, and a client receives the certificate and knows if it's valid because it's signed by some authority in which they trust. Now, you know, in preparing for this talk, I had this, this thesis, right, or this theory that, um, you know, we've outgrown the situation for the circumstances in which SSL was originally designed. You know, that this is just a different time, a different world, and that the, the, the way that this was designed does not really apply to the situation that we're in today. And so I thought, well, I wonder if that's true. And so I thought, I should ask the people that designed it. You know, what were they thinking? And so I thought, well, who even designed SSL? And so, you know, I did some research, whatever, looked up, found the first uh, IETF draft that got uh, published, and. Uh, SSL was designed by this, this guy, uh, Kip Hickman, who was an employee at Netscape in 1993 and 94. And um, he, the last thing that he posted to the internet was in 1995. So he was a little bit difficult to track down, but I finally found him. And uh, you know, I talked to some people on Netscape who you know, gave me some contact info and some other people, and eventually I found him. And uh, I basically just like cold called him, called him on the phone, you know. And I was like, uh, is this kid a thing? Yeah. Did you, did you used to work for Netscape? A long time ago. Like, did you design SSL? Who is this? <laughs> yeah. We talked, you know, and uh, it, it was amazing. And he's like, ah, SSL, I haven't thought about that in a long time. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's still with us. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, and I was like, I was like, so this whole certificate authority thing. He's like, oh yeah, that whole authenticity thing. He's like, I tell you, we just threw that in at the end. <laughs> He's like, you know, this was really designed to prevent passive attacks, and someone told us about this thing, the man in the middle attack, you know, and so we just threw that in. And, it, you know, it's like, really, we didn't know how it was going to work. The whole thing was a bit of a hand wave. <laughs> wow, all right. Uh, and I was like, so, you know, it's did not working out that well, you know. <laughs> like, uh, you know, and it's, so part of the problem seems to be like it's a scaling issue. You know, how did you see the scaling over time? And he's like, scaling? He's like, you have to remember, you know, at the time, Yahoo was a site with 30 links on it. That's what Yahoo was. And I was like, all right. He's like, we didn't think about it. You know, it's like, it's totally different. Like, okay, all right. Uh, get it. And, and it kind of makes sense. You know, if you look at the, the history of, you know, how things have gone, you know, back in 94 when the number of domains on the internet is approaching zero, you know, it kind of makes sense. Okay, you know, you, you have maybe less than 10 secure sites. Uh, you have some authority. It looks very closely at, you know, those 10 sites and at science certificates, and we're done. You know, but, you know, over time, now we're approaching, you know, a billion domains. Ideally, we'd like all of them to be secure. And it seems kind of unrealistic that we can find a party or even a set of parties that are going to be able to look very carefully, you know, at a billion domains and, you know, certify them correctly. 
Now, uh, and history has kind of borne this out. You know, if you look, uh, Ivan Ristik put together a, a very nice uh, threat matrix of you know all the things that can go wrong and with SSL. And you know, um, up here you have some of the integrity and, and, and uh, secrecy problems uh, that have occurred over time. Down here you have some of the, um, the kind of the user experience problems. These are things like SSL strip that have come up. Uh, but really up here is uh, all of the authenticity stuff. And this is which is what has always caused some friction is now causing real problems. Um, so I think, you know, if going back and looking at the story of Komodo, the lesson should not be that this was cyber war, you know, that this was some, you know, crazy incident. But this is the kind of thing that's probably happening every day. Um, you know, remember, like one of the sites in this that this attacker got, login.live.com. Um, in 2009, Mike Zussman got the certificate just by asking for it. He, he didn't have to export functions from DLLs or create his own SOAP APIs or whatever this guy did, you know. He just asked for it. You know, Eddie Nick got Mozilla.com with no validation at all. Just signed up. Uh, VeriSign issued a code signing certificate from Microsoft Corporation to attackers that are still unidentified today. Uh, recently, I was trying to get an SSL certificate. I have a really hard time getting SSL certificates now. <laughs> it's, um, it's kind of ridiculous. It's like they had a meeting. Um, but so, you know, I thought right, straight to the bottom of the barrel. And I went to a website, SSLinabox.com. And it's one of these things where you gotta like, you know, create an account before you can get your certificate. So I, you know, type in my thing, you like create the account, and I click on the create account button and it just logs me into someone else's account. Fuck, all right. Uh, I'm not even trying to hack this. I just want a, I just want a certificate, you know? So all right, log out, you know, and like type in my thing, whatever. Create account. Logs me into someone else's account. Every time, I just got a different account, you know? And I was, you know, I was just like, all right, if I, you know, I could keep doing this until I found something interesting, but, you know, actually, I just want a certificate, and this is a waste of time. Uh, and, you know, it's like, I didn't even bother emailing them about this, right? You know, it's like, I'm sure that they don't care. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time. Um, here's a certificate authority that actually published their private key in the public directory of their web server. And the interesting thing is that, you know, people make mistakes, whatever, but uh, this is still there. <laughs> they still haven't removed it. It's been there since 2009. These are the people securing the internet. Uh, Starcom recently got hacked. Uh, DigiNotar got hacked recently. Been in the news, big press. Same guy, same, the Komodo guy, again. You know, I think, you know, what this should tell us is not that this guy is like super sophisticated elite hacker, right? But that the bar is really low. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is like, you don't even have to go through the trouble of hacking a certificate authority. You know, if, if you really want us to be able to sign certificates, you can just buy an intermediate certificate, intermediate CA certificate. You go to you know a company like GeoTrust. Most of the CAs have programs like this. But you can go to GeoTrust. It's like 50 grand, and they'll give you a certificate which you're supposed to use to only sign your own sort of internal certificates, as long as you promise not to sign other certificates. They give this to you. I like. I think the logo is really appropriate. It's like the key to the world. <laughs> and this is actually, you know, people ask me all the time, it's like, don't you think that this is kind of cyber war, Iran doing this stuff, whatever? And this is one of the reasons I think that's not true. You know, it's like Iran wouldn't have to go through the trouble of, like, hacking a distributed authority. They could just come up with 50 grand to buy one. <laughs> so, you know, and so the other question, you know, what if this was state-sponsored? What if this was Iran, you know, this is cyber war or whatever? You know, well, the, the other thing to remember is that the only reason that Iran would have to hack a CA or buy a CA certificate or any of this stuff, it's just because they don't have one of their own. You know, but uh, many countries do. Um, the uh, EFF has a nice project called the SSL Observatory where they scan the internet and they collect, you know, collect all of the certificates that they could find and they were able to put together a list of um, authorities, uh, you know, people that are capable of signing certificates on the internet, which is actually not immediately straightforward. Um, and uh, so, you know, many of them are nation states. And so this is a map of the countries in the world uh, that are currently capable of intercepting secure communication. That we're, we're trusting these countries with our secure communication. They can sign certificates. Um, and it's a lot. It's a lot of countries. And, I, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but out, way out in the center of the Atlantic Ocean there, just, you know, off the coast of the United States, is a little red speck. That's Bermuda. 
Bermuda is capable of signing certificates. Actually, I, so I, you know, I gave this talk once before, and uh, later I got an email from the guys in Bermuda. They were like, hey, that's us. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Keep it real. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So the good news is that I feel like the narrative is kind of shifting. You know, the vibe is shifting. Um, from the old vibe of, like, this is a total ripoff, to the new vibe of, this is a total ripoff, and worthless. <laughs> we're not actually getting any security benefit. But I think that, it, you know, so, so now there's some talk about moving forward. You're replacing certificate authorities with something else, coming up with a better system. And I think that if we're gonna do that, it's important that we really succinctly understand the problem of what we have today, so that we don't end up just putting ourselves in the same situation all over again. Um, now, there have been like a couple of what I consider to be like kind of um, simplistic reactions to the, the situation that we're in. Uh, you know, the EFF put together the SSL Observatory, and they you know, came up with a list of all the certificate authorities on the internet. And this is a graph of the bodies on the internet that are currently capable of signing certificates. And it's a lot. It's a lot of different organizations. In fact, it's 650 uh, different organizations are capable of signing certificates and thus intercepting secure communication on the internet today. And so I think one kind of simplistic reaction is just to say, well, there's too many of them. There's too many certificate authorities. We just, what we need, the answer, is less certificate authorities. But remember when there was only one? And they could do and charge whatever they wanted? That didn't really feel much better to me, actually, back then. And if part of the problem is that we've you know, grown from you know, 10 or 20 sites that we want to be secure to 2 million, and ideally a billion. It kind of seems like less security, less certificate authorities is actually not the answer. That part of the problem is this kind of scaling problem, that if anything, we would want more organizations to be able to keep up with um, you know, this new demand. The other thing that people have said in sort of the general um, category of things that, that people have said about the problem that we have is that there are a few bad apples. You know, that most of these certificate authorities, they're okay, uh, but there's just a few you know, bad ones that, that have fucked things up. And uh, I, you know, I don't know about this either. You know, I think that there's, there's some people that are better at managing their image than others. And you know, there are people that uh, you know, happen to get caught. Uh, but I think if you look closely at you know, the, the organizations that we're, we're putting our trust in, none of them are really doing that great. You know, even Verisign, which was you know, originally considered Even Verisign, which was There you go. States that might not trust the Department of Homeland Security, their communication. 
and I'm, I'm one of them. So I think, you know, in order to actually really define the problem, to kind of have a succinct view of what it is that we're trying to fix, I think it's useful to go back to this, this question. What happened to Komodo? Well, nothing. But why? You know, what could we have done? Why is it that nothing happened to Komodo? Well, if I decide that I don't trust Komodo, and I don't, what can I do? Well, the very best I could do is to remove Komodo from my trust database, to remove them from my list of trusted authorities. And this is the same thing that a, a browser manager could do, right? Uh, the problem is that if you do that, somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the internet disappears. Totally breaks, stops working. Because somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the internet is secured by Komodo. And suddenly, now that's all big warning, exceptions, problems, background content doesn't load. Now, I could take an ideological stance to ne never visit those sites again because they're part of the Komodo cabal, whatever. Uh, but, but really, there's no appropriate response. And the thing to remember is that this is as true for browser vendors as it is for you or me. That a browser vendor is in the exact same situation. The best that they can do is remove Komodo, and you know now they're breaking the, a quarter of the internet for all of their users. So that's a really tough decision for them to make. You know, in the case of DigiNotar, which is a, another recent attack, the only reason that they were able to untrust DigiNotar is because, you know, it's a, it's a tiny security authority, very small. Uh, all of the sites that they certify are in Holland, and the people that make these decisions live in Mountain. So they they don't really care. Uh, but you know, with with uh, any like reasonable uh, certificate authority, um, you know, I'd say the common case. Uh, the truth is that uh, somewhere along the line, we made a decision to trust Komodo, and now we're locked into trusting them. Forever. We can never untrust them. And I think that this is the essence of the problem. I think that you know what we need to fix uh, is 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 this. Right? And I think you know all of the problems that we have with certificate authorities today can be boiled down to a single missing property, and I call that property trust agility. Uh, the components of trust agility are first that a trust decision can be easily revised at any time. And now there are plenty of people that say, oh, Moxie, you don't trust anybody. Uh, that's not true. And today, there are any number of organizations that I can identify for me that I would trust to certify my secure communication. But what seems insane to me is to think that I could identify an organization or a set of organizations that I would be willing to trust not just now, but forever, without any incentive to continue warranting my trust, without the ability to ever untrust them. The second component to trust agility is that individual users can decide where to anchor their trust. And this is the same thing as saying individual clients, or a web browser, or whatever it is, can decide where to anchor their trust. Um, now, if we go back and look at you know, the scoping issue, right? You know, some people say, oh, well, you know, problem, Verisign, Komodo are the same scope, we just need a new separate scope, right? Uh, so the idea is, you know, if they had separate scopes, then, you know, let's say Facebook is signed by Verisign, Verisign does something particularly egregious, uh, Facebook could just you know, switch to a different certificate authority. And uh, that would fix the problem, unlike today, where Verisign could just continue to sign certificates for Facebook, whether they wanted them, wanted them to or not. But I think, you know, if we look at this realistically, if it's been a struggle to even convince sites to deploy HTTPS to begin with, it seems like kind of a stretch that they're going to be continually making these, these decisions in our best interest. The other thing is that in this increasingly globalized world, it doesn't really seem to make sense that there's one trust decision that's made for everybody. And then particularly it's you know, whoever it is that administers a, a website like Facebook or, or Google, who gets to make that trust decision for everybody in the world. Now how could they possibly account for you know, all the different factors that different people have in different places? You know, different people have different trust metrics, you know, different threats. The other thing is that it's, it's our data. Should be our trust decision, right? And it's not Facebook's data; it's ours. So, you know, I think that this property that you know individual clients or users decide where to anchor their trust is actually just a really simple inversion of the situation that we have today. You know, right now, you know, there's any there's three parties involved in any secure transaction here on the internet. You have you know the client, the server, and then this external authority. And right now, this uh, trust relationship is initiated by the server. The server makes a connection to an authority and says, hey, will you please certify my website? The authority responds to the, the server with a certificate, and the certificate is then transmitted back to the client through, 
through the server. So, you know, what we're proposing here is actually a simple inversion. It's the user that initiates the trust relationship. So instead of the server contacting the authority, it's the user that contacts the authority and says, hey, will you please certify this site that I want to connect to for me? Now, it's a simple inversion, but the reason it's so powerful is because that means the user is the one that can decide what authority to talk to. Which means this problem, the scoping issue, you know, of like, oh, the Department of Homeland Security can sign certificates for Chinese sites, it's, it, it actually doesn't matter because, you know, users in China could just decide to ignore that authority. You know, instead they talk to China. Or maybe they decide that they don't trust China either and they talk to some NGO instead. Now, I think that these two properties are essential for us moving forward that, and that, you know, they very succinctly uh, address the problem that we're looking at today. That if we don't integrate this into whatever solution that we come up with, we're going to end up back in the exact same situation again. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about uh, DNSSEC, because you know, this has come up a few times uh, in discussions about SSL and authenticity. The basic idea is that we can use DNSSEC to fix SSL authenticity by um, taking an SSL certificate and basically shoving it in your DNS record. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. There's actually many RFCs about exactly how to do this. Um, but the way it would work is, you know, a client uh, does a normal DNS lookup for a site that they want to connect to, paypal.com, and when they get their DNS response back, um, it includes not just the IP address of the server they want to connect to, but also the site's SSL certificate. And these things are known to be valid because it's DNSSEC and the, and the DNS record is signed. Uh, and so now when you connect to paypal.com, you get a certificate back from the website, you can just make sure it's the same thing that was in the DNS record that you got, and everything's good. Um, now, I feel like there's a, an, a really immediately visceral appeal to uh, this scheme when people hear about it. And I think it's because people tend to mentally associate DNS with the word distributed. And that sounds really great. It sounds like exactly what we need right now. You know, after years of suffering under the centralized yoke of certificate authorities, you just wipe that off the page and replace it with a distributed system instead. Sounds great. The problem is that when you start to look at it closely, in DNS, it's the information that is distributed. The individual DNS records are distributed across zones. Um, but the trust is extremely centralized and hierarchical. And that's actually how the CA system works today. The information, the actual certificates, are distributed across the internet on the web servers of the various sites that you're going to connect to. But the trust is highly centralized in a few certificate authorities. So, okay, then we think, right, well, it's not distributed. Um, maybe it's better some other way. Uh, maybe there's some trust agility in there somewhere. Or maybe even this, the set of organizations that we're signing up to trust forever are somehow better than the set of organizations that we currently have to trust forever. And so, you know, we think, all right, well, who do we have to trust? Well, it turns out that in DNSSEC, there are basically three classes of people that we have to trust. Um, and you know, any, anybody in these three classes of people can intercept our secure communication. Um, the first class is the registrars. Now, if you think CAs are sketchy, I think registrars might take it up a notch. They just have always been a little bit sketchy. Um, personally, I think it should be laughable that the current first step in deploying DNSSEC is to create an account with GoDaddy. <laughs> I think that should be laughable. The second class of organizations that we have to trust are the TLDs, those zones, and the people that manage them. Now, in the case of .com and .net, most popular TLDs on the internet, uh, that means we have to trust Verisign, because they manage those zones. Same player, same game. Uh, in the case of other TLDs, like .org, .edu, um, the people that manage them are probably not uh, organizations that you've ever heard of before. Uh, certainly, I think that if you were to, you know, someone to ask you, like, well, who do you really trust in the world? Like, the people that manage these are not the people that would immediately come to mind in terms of uh, who you trust. Now, take a minute to, like, look at the organizations that manage these TLDs. Look at the people who are on the board, who run operations, and ask yourself, are these the people that we want to trust with all of our secure communication? Then there's the country code TLDs. Um, you know, in the case of them, it's the governments behind the TLD. Uh, do every, does everybody with you know hip domains like .io, .cc, and .ly trust the corresponding governments uh, behind those domains? 
Uh, what about uh, TLDs like .ir and .cn? Should the citizens of you know, countries visiting local sites uh, have to trust their, their governments uh, with all of their secure communication? The EFS SSL observatory data currently, uh, you know, uh, paints this picture of, you know, these are the governments in the world that are capable of intercepting secure communication. Under DNSSEC, uh, the same picture would look like this. And if the recent domain seizures are any indication of the future, I feel like, you know, TLDs are perhaps um, something that we should be looking out for. And the third class of people that we have to trust here are the root. Uh, in this case, that's ICANN. Now, I don't have any particular views with ICANN, uh, but I would say that you know, while they have made some attempts to be really like a global organization and solicit global involvement, as far as I know, um, you know, from research that I've done, you know, at the end of the day, they're a California 501c3 nonprofit, and um, as far as I know, that means that they're subject to U.S. laws. Um, and if the recent legislation, things like COICA, Protect IP, are any indication of the future. You know, I, I, to me, what matters is not so much whether this legislation passes or doesn't pass, and actually it's not looking good, um, but that they're trying, and maybe one day they'll succeed. So that's something to watch out for. Now, the worst thing about you know, these class of organizations is that actually they provide reduced trust agility. But today, even as unrealistic as it might be, if I decide that I don't trust VeriSign, and I don't, you know, I at least have the option of removing them from the trust database uh, in my SSL client or my web browser. Um, and sure, you know, that's going to break you know, some large number of sites on the internet, but at least I could do it. Um, but uh, there's nothing that I can do that changes the fact that VeriSign manages .com and .net uh, under DNSSEC. Uh, which means that if we sign up to trust these organizations today, we're signing up to trust them forever. Uh, regardless of whether they continue to warrant our trust or not. Uh, so let's take a moment to talk about some things that I think are a little bit more inspiring. Um, this is one project called uh, Perspectives, which is uh, originally a paper that was uh, published at CMU by Dan Winland, uh, David Anderson, and Adrian Perry. Uh, and the paper was basically uh, on using multipath probing for authenticity. And the basic idea is using network perspective. Uh, it, it works like this. Let's say you connect to a website, paypal.com, and you get back a certificate. And the big question is, is the certificate valid or not? Well, what do you do? Um, essentially, under the perspectives model, you connect to an authority, and you say, hey, what certificate do you see for PayPal? And it just makes a normal SSL connection to PayPal, gets back a certificate, trans transmits that back to you on the client side, and you just compare the certificate you saw with the certificate that the authority saw. You're essentially using network perspective to get a separate view uh, at the same certificate. Now, uh, we call these authorities notaries. And you don't have to just have one, you can have any number of notaries. And the notaries are distributed uh, all across the internet, so they have different uh, network perspectives at the same site. You're essentially building a constellation of trust. Now, this idea of using network perspective is actually not new. It's actually how things work right now on the internet today. Today, let's say that um, a, you want to get a certificate for your website, PayPal.com. Now, the trust relationship is initiated by the server side in this case. But the server administrator, what does he do? He contacts uh, VeriSign or some you know, certificate authority and says, hey, I would like a certificate for my website. What does VeriSign do then? They send an email to the website with a verification code in it. Uh, and if you're capable of uh, accessing uh, that email, you get the verification code, uh, and the uh, authority responds with the certificate. Again, it's just using network perspective. All we're trying to do is invert this relationship so that it's actually user or client initiated. Now, um, when Perspectives was first introduced, uh, it came with an implementation. Uh, it was kind of like a proof of concept, uh, but it was a little bit limited because it was designed primarily for self signed certificates. The idea was that uh, you could use this thing, perspectives, in order to validate self signed certificates, and then you'd never have to you know, be faced with another self signed certificate warning again. Uh, but so the problem is that if you try and use it in the case of just, I want to replace certificate authorities entirely, uh, it has some limitations. Uh, the first problem is uh, completeness. Uh, that 
Perspectives was designed to only work on the initial connection that your web browser makes to a website. Uh, it doesn't function for all the background content, CSS, images, JavaScript, all that stuff that gets loaded. And so it's not possible to actually remove all certificates from your trust database because you need them to validate all that background content. Uh, you can't eliminate the certificate authorities entirely. The second problem is privacy. Now, if every time that you uh, make a connection to a website and give back a certificate, you connect to a notary, you're essentially leaking your entire browsing history to this you know, set of external entities, which seems unfortunate. And uh, the other big problem was responsiveness. Uh, there's this issue of notary lag. The idea is, um, the way that Perspectives works was you get a certificate back, you contact a notary, and you say, hey, what certificate do you see for this website? Uh, and the notary is going to um, make a connection. It's going to keep a cache, a local cache, that doesn't have to connect down to this website every time that you did. Uh, and then it was the notary's responsibility to then periodically scan all of the websites that it had uh, you know, a, a cache of certificates for uh, to see if the website had changed certificates. And the problem is that if you visit the website in between that scan interval and it has changed certificates, uh, then you're going to have a certificate mismatch and uh, you're going to get a certificate there. Uh, so that was a big problem. So what I've done is I've taken um, perspectives and I've uh, tried to build on it to uh, provide a, kind of a more generic, uh, usable solution to replace certificate authorities entirely. And you know what I came up with is called convergence. Uh, convergence is a new protocol, a new client implementation, and a new server, server implementation. The first thing that we do is address uh, these three limitations: against privacy and responsiveness. Um, we start by uh, eliminating notary lag, this whole concept of notary lag. And it's a simple solution. Basically, every time you contact a notary, you include the certificate that you saw as well. And so now the notary can see if there's a cache, cache mismatch, and if there is, then it connects out to the site. And you don't have to periodically be scanning the internet. Uh, the second thing we did was address privacy. Uh, first, by introducing local caching. So what happens is, uh, if you get an OK response from a set of notaries for some certificate, you take that certificate and you put it in a local cache. Now the next time you connect to the same website, if you see the same certificate as what's in your local cache, you don't have to talk to any notaries, and you just you know, keep going. Which means that you only have to, you're only leaking your connection history uh, the first time you connect to a website or on a, whenever the website changes their certificate. But that still doesn't seem great. Uh, so the next thing that we did was introduce um, an uh, anonymity layer. So let's say that you have a, a set of notaries configured uh, that is your trust constellation for, and you want to talk to all of them. Now, uh, at the beginning of your validation request, what you do is you take one notary and you, uh, you assign it to be a bounce. You connect, connect to that notary and you make SSL connections all the way through that notary to the other notaries. Uh, so basically, the bounce notary knows who you are, but it doesn't know what you're asking about uh, because that's all through SSL. The other notaries know what you're asking about, but they don't know who you are. And uh, notaries would actually have to collude with each other in order to reveal your browsing history, which I feel like is a much higher and acceptable bar. Um, convergence is a, um, you know, has, is a Firefox add-on um, in its first implementation. And the way it works is it, you put it, you install it in your web browser, and everything works exactly the same. The only difference is in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you have this little convergence icon. And if you click the icon, convergence is enabled, and you are completely off the CA system. Toggle it on, no more certificate authorities. Toggle it off, back to the CA system. Toggle it on. Uh, and everything works exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is that you know, normally if you visit a uh, secure site uh, and you you know, hover your uh, mouse over the favicon, uh, you get a little tool tip, you know, saying, you know, this is the certificate authority that validated this website. The only difference uh, in convergence, everything is exactly the same, except uh, we remove the certificate authorities from the picture entirely, that all of your communication is validated by convergence instead of the authorities. Um, it's also, uh, convergence is designed to be extensible for the future, that it's actually not tied to this concept of network perspective. Uh, the idea is that uh, we've developed a RESTful API. So you connect to a notary and you ask it to you know, validate a site for you, and it can actually validate it based on any strategy that it wants. Uh, so the default is to use network perspective. But it could, it could do anything. It could do DNSSEC. Uh, 
Uh, it could use CA signatures if it's crazy. Um, it could uh, do something weird like uh, use the front end to the SSL observatory data. Uh, it could use Google's certificate catalog. Uh, and you could have uh, any number of notaries configured, uh, all of which do different things. You have one notary that does DNSSEC, another that uses CA signatures, another that uses the SSL observatory, another one that uses network perspective. And, you know, um, convergence comes with a mechanism to basically specify your threshold of trust. And by default, it's a majority or consensus. Um, so what this means is that unlike in the CA system, let's say you have 650 different organizations and any one of them turns into a bad actor, you're out of luck. Uh, in the convergence system, what this means is that one bad actor is not enough to compromise your communication. That actually all of them would have to collude with each other together in order to compromise your communication. Which means that the, the more notaries that you have, actually the more secure that you are. Just sort of the inverse of how things work with the certificate of the race today. And it provides total trust agility. If for some reason you decide you don't trust one of these notaries anymore, you can just remove it. And that's it, nothing breaks. The internet continues to function. You don't get any certificate errors suddenly. Everything's fine. And if you'd like, you could replace it with a different notary that you know, maybe does something different or is just a different organization that you trust. Now, some nice things about uh, this are that the servers do nothing. We don't have to ask them to do anything in this situation. We don't have to migrate the internet to some other system. They continue to get certificates, put them in, you know, on their web server, and then they go. Uh, which means that all we have to do is implement con convergence in the four major browsers, and then we're done. That's the end of the CA system four places to, to make this change, and game over. Um, it also means that there's no such thing as like self-signed certificate warnings. You can have a website, get a self-signed certificate, use that, and it looks identical to having a signed certificate. There's some problems with convergence right now. Uh, the big one is uh, this thing, the Citibank problem. Uh, but the idea is some websites, uh, notably Citibank, uh, have for some reason like 100 different certificates. Uh, so if you're using Network Perspective to validate the website, it's a little tricky because your client sees one certificate and then, you know, maybe you have 10 notaries configured, all 10 might see 10 different certificates. And it looks identical to the case of a man-in-the-middle attack um, when using Network Perspective. Now, the nice thing is that there aren't actually many websites on the internet like this. Uh, we, we've only found, like, you know, two others other than Citibank. Uh, so it might not be a big deal to, for these sites to actually just change the way that they're operating. And in fact, you know, I gave a talk uh, recently, and after the talk, a guy came up to me and he was like, hey, I work for Citibank, and, you know, it's fucked up, why do we do that? I mean, we're going to change that, you know. Like, All right, great. Um, the other problem is captive portals. Uh, you know, there's this situation, right, let's say you're at the airport, or you're at a hotel, and you want to uh, connect to the wireless and they have some kind of captive portal set up where first you have to, you get redirected to this other site and you have to enter your credit card number and all this stuff and now you'd like for that to be secure uh, but the problem is that you can't talk to your notaries elsewhere on the internet to validate this uh, captive portal because you can't make connections to the internet yet because you haven't uh, typed in your credit card. Uh, and so that situation it's actually, it's not, it's not terribly difficult. They let DNS out almost 100% of the time so we just need to use DNS as a transport for communicating with notaries which is something they're working on. So this, uh, this entire system, Convergence, is a, it's a beta system, but it's available for download. Uh, we have like 30,000 users right now. Uh, you can get it at uh, convergence.io. Um, and so even if you're not you know, interested in Convergence, or this doesn't end up being you know, the one true solution for the future, um, the one question I want to leave you with is this. When evaluating any kind of new trust system, or uh, a replacement for authenticity in SSL or anything else, I think the very first question that you should ask is, who do I have to trust and for how long? If the, if the response is a prescribed set of people forever, proceed with caution. Uh, in the meantime, try to convert.